Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for the opportunity of being here with you today. Um, I'm going to give you two perspectives from Katie's excellent presentation. 2008, I was then Chief Executive of the Medical Research Council before the first Concordat was created. And we create, the Concordat was created with, basically as the research councils were driving that Concordat, for the first time to be able to hold institutions that held awards from research councils to account for how they looked after researchers, and particularly researchers in development. And before that time, I have to be honest with you, it really was the Wild West. Um, it still may feel like that to you, uh, but nevertheless, it was a situation that you were employed, and that was your employment, and that's the lot. And it was up to the institution as to what they provided. There was no demand from the funders for any deliverable to the post office career. The whole deal was you did your post office, you did your research, um, and the funder wanted to know what the outcomes of the research were, and wherever, whatever happened to you happened to be a happenstance. So a group of us who'd actually been through this system and knew how difficult it was wanted to come together to at least create a sense of responsibility on employers and on funders to actually come together to make sure that there was a real prospect of developing something into the future for postdocs. And it was, a, it was a coconut chai, it was a first shot at something that we all wanted to see happen, but we knew it would have to evolve and it would have to be the subject of development. And we also knew that there was likely to be a Pandora's box that we were going to open, that we actually raised the level of expectations of those coming forward with already all of the uncertainties of a research career. Now, I wish I could say the imponderables and uncertainties of a research-based career have got a lot easier. In fact, in many ways, I would say they've actually got a lot tougher, and I'm quite happy to pick that up in questions as to why I would pick on that. But I arrived in Cambridge in 2010. Now, Cambridge is an amazing institution in many ways. But in my very first speech to the university here, the question that I posed to the university was a simple one. Which do you think is the largest employee group in this institution of the University of Cambridge? And I've got a whole lot of stuff over professors or whatever. And I just pointed out to them that at that time, we had 3,000 postdocs in this institution. That number has grown steadily up to 4,000 at the present time. The question I pose to them is, so do you think this amazing community, the bedrock of what an institution like Cambridge is going to have to deliver in the future, that bedrock we depend upon, how do we treat them? There's a concordat out there. I can tell you from what I knew at the MRC, uh, yeah, it was being listened to and some were good at trying to respect it, Frankly, many institutions in Cambridge, among them, probably were driving a coach and horses through many of the, uh, the areas. So the question was, how do we tighten that up? And how do we begin to empower the postdoc community to start standing up for themselves as being a core part of this institution? And there were four values that I think we changed at that time. You're, you're looking at several attempts that we're making to begin to recognize the huge importance that postdocs play in our problem. Number one, stop thinking of postdocs, dare I say, as the laboratory cannon fodder of actually getting the publications out. Because that's where, at the end of the day, most people who apply for a grant will want a postdoc on it in order to get to an end outcome. We started to want to ensure that postdocs were respected as researchers uh, in development. They were part of the academic community, not merely a member of support staff or, or seen in that light, but actually that they were an integral part of the academic community of Cambridge. Now within Cambridge, what was strange is of course postdocs at that point were more or less precluded from engaging with the colleges. They kind of came into their lab and worked in the lab they had no status within the university other than being an employee of the university. And so the first thing was to begin to create an office of postdoctoral affairs 
and to make a very senior academic who accounted directly to the Vice Chancellor to actually take responsibility for the whole community, not just the scientists, but those in the arts and humanities, and scattered throughout the institution, and also to open that up to neighboring institutions like the MRC and BDSRC and the variety of units we have in this region. The next was to talk to the postdocs themselves and to empower them to begin to develop their own association that could work with the Office of, of, of Postdoctoral Affairs to make sure that many of the issues that uh, uh, postdocs face were actually going to be taken on board by the institution to provide a route, which they haven't had even in an institution like this, to act as a body to try to improve the opportunities for development, the opportunities for their own future career prospects. The fourth element was to talk to postdocs directly. That's something that I really did enjoy doing. And actually to ask the question, what is it you'd like? Well, you can probably guess what the number one issue was, create more jobs. Um, at the end, I would say, well, that's where the rub comes, then hence why my response to the uh, question that you posed. The truth is, is we have to look at a rather unpalatable statistic. There are many more postdocs than there ever will be permanent jobs in the academic sector in the United Kingdom or even worldwide to accommodate everyone. So we are on a pyramid and from undergraduate that pyramid closes down as you begin to go through and it's competitive. And I'm going to make a statement which some of you may find difficult. I can see no way in which that will be anything other than continuing to be competitive in terms of people's ability uh, to gain uh, permanent positions uh, at the end of the day. But what we can do is to facilitate the process that's there. So for Cambridge, one of the next things that became very apparent that the postdocs asked for is, well, OK, we come from around the world, but this city is getting as expensive as London to live in. And we found postdocs were living 20 miles away because that's where housing becomes more affordable. Commute times were akin to what I was used to at Imperial College, where the average commute time for a postdoc is one hour, 10 minutes, one way. That takes out two hours, two and a half hours out of a, a day. That's not much to look forward to. And we wanted our postdoc community to integrate more closely. And hence, you are sitting in one of the outcomes of that. So the university has invested a billion pounds in order to create this whole campus that you're sitting in. This is the center of that campus. Uh, I think we're opening it tomorrow formally. Um, but these rooms and these offices are here for the postdoc. But the accommodation that you see around We've decided to make sure that we have ultimately about 5,000 units available at affordable rents in order that people could actually not have to worry about that accommodation. For the university, the real benefit has been that this is within cycling or walking distance to most people's places of employment. So if you're in physics or elsewhere, you just literally cross the road. If you have to cycle into the town, you're less than a mile away. And even going down to Adam Brooks is reasonable with Uni4 when it's running on time. So we tried to, uh, to put that investment in behind the community to make this happen. Where do we go from here? Well, my own belief is that what we need to do, and I think Katie, you've touched on it, is to give the Concordia an ever-increasing amount of teeth. There are some of those issues on that concordat that are going to be very difficult to move away from. Um, as Vice-Chancellor, I would tell you the most difficult is fixed-term contracts. Um, you will see it in a different perspective to the way that I see it. I have, in this institution, there are 4,000 postdocs. I only have 1,600 academic positions of which 80% become vacant in this university at the point of retirement, which is one of the reasons we have such a male, female skew at senior positions, because frankly, most people don't leave Cambridge if they're appointed here permanently until they retire. That is why Cambridge has retained and the academic staff voted for a retention of a forced retirement age, which is again very different to most other institutions because they recognize that people have to be made to leave their tenured positions if we're going to get any pull through uh, of staff. 
So you can work out for yourselves, I can't suddenly increase the number of tenured positions by 4,000 in order to accommodate every post office that comes in. I can't give open-ended contracts because I pick up a liability for picking up uh, those uh, career options. And therefore, there has to be a shared risk in, uh, in, in this endeavor. And that is very difficult to get away from. It's compounded by UK law, which says that once you are employed for four years or more, you actually have tenure within that institution. But Cambridge is also peculiar that we do not have great difficulty in moving on any non-performing individual from the organization. That is historic. Um, when I was at Imperial College, that was much easier to do. And therefore, we can't just take people on and forever expand the academic community. And that is a problem. And that is a problem for funders, it's a problem for you, and it's certainly a problem for institutions. It's not a lack of willingness, it's actually how much resource there is to be able to grow the research community. Secondly, can we begin to look at making sure that other elements in a postdoc's career are actually taken into account into, during times when appointments to permanent positions are made. And there's a great deal of movement in Europe at the moment over the tenure track movement that started particularly in Germany and elsewhere where people are taken on with a view to being given a tenure track position. And that's something that I think does need exploration in a wider context. So no guarantees but the opportunity that within an institution if success, follow success, really can be able to be made to work. And publications cannot be the be all and end all. This is my particular bugbear, because all of us in science know that 90% of what we do is going to find a negative answer. And to merely reward the few who happen to be lucky that they've hit on something which gives a positive result and therefore gets into science or nature or, you know, the major historical journals or the economic review or something as a consequence really does not give the true picture of the ability of somebody to drive things through. Sometimes conducting the most important negative study is just as important. And yet I still have not seen in interview committees I sit on due cognizance being given to all of the other activities that postdocs now undertake. So I think we need to redefine the very nature of what the academic community is looking from, for, from the postdoc community. So for me, this building is a real denouement. I have 10 days to go in office, so you can see I'm talking fairly freely. Um, uh, I'm now not encumbered by being able to be hauled to account by a council or anyone else in this institution. Um, but I can talk with a degree of passion because this will matter for the future. And I'm going on to be chairman of Cancer Research UK, which is a major funding body that funds an awful lot of postdoctoral positions in the UK. So many of the issues that you're addressing here are ones that are going to become very pertinent for me. And if I have to take away one measure of success from my time at Cambridge, maybe you're sitting in it, that actually, if nothing else, I hope that we've shown we care and we do want to make sure that everyone develops. And the good news is, do you know what? If you start the ball rolling, everyone else joins in. So in our Cambridge community here, we have a lot of colleges. And colleges didn't take postdocs previously. I think the position now is that virtually all colleges now have a postdoc stream. They're trying to make them feel engaged. And momentum, once you can get it, can begin to gain that recognition. So this incredibly valued community of individuals who have taken considerable risks with their careers in being able to move forward, accept, there is an acceptance of that risk. We've got to minimize the risks that they take and maximize the opportunities that you guys can all develop a fruitful career going forward. Join me therefore in one other thing, and that's fighting to ensure that we actually end up with sufficient research funding so that what you've learned as postdocs can truly be taken on, both by the United Kingdom and increasingly by a broader Europe. But therein, I will stop and not enter the Brexit debate. <laughs> so I'm happy to take any questions from you. Don't worry about whatever the theme is, and I'll try and answer them as honestly as I can, either from the perspective of a funder or from the perspective
perspective of a university such as Cambridge. May I take the opportunity of saying to each and every one of you, welcome to, to this great city. Uh, have a chance to look around while you're here as well. And I hope you have a good time during this meeting elsewhere. And please stay in touch with us because the concept of a national movement, post going forward, you have an enormous amount of clout and you will be listened to. But miracles take a little bit longer to achieve as well. 